Jody Arias killed Travis Alexander. There is no question about it. The million dollar question is what would have forced her to do it. And throughout this trial, you will hear that Jody was indeed forced. In just under two minutes, we go from the last picture taken of Travis in the shower, in just under two minutes, to the picture of Travis's body. You can see the foot in the front with his head and his shoulders, and blood clearly on his shoulders. In just those two minutes, Jody had to make a choice. She would either live or she would die. Jody did not always tell the truth about what happened that night. She was scared. Scared about what had happened and scared about what she had done. She had absolutely no experience with police interrogation before. And so when they talked to her, she wasn't always truthful. Her fear and her panic about what had happened led her to tell different stories. But you will learn that what she said, those stories, were not the truth. Throughout this trial, you will learn more about Jody Arias, much more about Jody. You will find that she is an articulate, bright young woman who is a very talented artist and photographer. But most of all, what you'll learn is that Jody loved Travis. And so what would have forced her to have to take Travis's life on that awful day? In order to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. Back to before, just before, she and Travis first met. Now, Travis and Jody met in September of 2006. At that time, Jody was in a relationship, a long-term relationship, with Daryl Brewer. Jody and Daryl had been together for four years at that point. Now, Jody and Daryl first met when Jody was working at the Ventana Inn and Spa. And Daryl was actually her boss. But she was quickly promoted to event planner, and when she was promoted, he was no longer her boss. And so the two began to date. And at the time, Daryl had just gotten through a very difficult divorce, and he really had no intentions of getting married again. But despite that, they still embarked on a relationship to see where it was going to lead them. What well, was serious enough that in June of 2005, they both put money down on a house and bought a house together in Palm Desert, California. Now, prepaid legal has two big conventions a year, and they had just had their convention in March, which Jody missed because she was just signing up. And so the next convention was in September, and the person who signed her up really talked to her about how important it is to go to these conventions so you can learn more about how to get people to buy insurance and so forth. And so, uh, in September of 2006, it was with the hope of gaining more financial stability that Jody, Michelle, and another girlfriend hopped in the car and drove up to Vegas. That's where the convention was being held. And it was actually being held at the MGM Grant. Now, the idea of this convention is that um, it is a long weekend full of meetings. Meetings about how great prepaid legal is, um, and as long as you can sell what they're trying to sell and you can get people to buy, you can stand to make a lot of money. And so lots of the parts of these meetings are people giving speeches about how to do it and why to do it and how much money you can make. After one of these meetings one day, um, Jody was having lunch with some of her friends that she had just met and some of the friends that she came with. And they were at the Rainforest Cafe in the MGM Grand. And she was standing just outside the Rainforest Cafe. There was a group of people, and she sees one man across the way. That man walks right up to her, makes a beeline, and says, Hi, my name's Travis Alexander. That is how Jody and Travis first met. They spent 
Over the rest of the weekend, Travis spent a lot of time with Jody, wowing her about how important he was. Because he was actually an executive director. Um, an executive director in prepaid legal, which means he was at a higher level in the company. He had a lot of people um, signing up underneath him, which pushes him up to a higher level. Um, she learned that because he was an executive director, that he would get to go to the executive director banquets. And after meeting Jody, he invited Jody to go. And so although it's a place that she normally wouldn't get to go because she had just signed up, she got to go to this executive banquet. She, he also invited her to sit in the front seats. So at these meetings, usually the front seats, the front rows, are reserved for people who are considered important in prepaid legal. It wouldn't have been Jody at that time. But because of Travis and his invitation, she got to sit up front. He took her through a tour of the casino. They talked and talked and talked. And in fact, at one point, they sat on a bench in the casino to the wee hours of the morning, where at some point, Travis actually tried to kiss Jody. But Jody had to stop him and remind him that she had a boyfriend, Daryl. During the time that they spent together, Jody learned a lot about Travis. Not only was he an executive director at prepaid legal, but he, um, being an executive director, he made many speeches at these conventions to try and get people to sign up at prepaid legal. Not only that, he was a Mormon, which is a religion that really emphasizes and values marriage and children. And they spoke a lot about that that weekend. Jody was captivated. After the convention, Travis kept in touch with Jody. They talked on the phone for hours. They continued talking and texting after the convention. And in fact, it was just four days after the convention when Jody had a sit down talk with Daryl. They talked about their relationship, how it wasn't really progressing, and they eventually broke up. Daryl moved into a different bedroom within their own house. It was only the following weekend after the convention, about a week and a half after the convention ended, that Travis convinced Jody to come and meet him at his friend's house in Marietta, California. And that was Chris and Sky Hughes. And Jody agreed. So she drove up to meet Travis with his friends at their house and spent the weekend with him. It was that weekend, a week and a half after first meeting Travis, that they introduced her to the Mormon church and they took her to church. It was a few days after that, the following Wednesday, that Travis on his way home from California, stopped, or back to Mesa, Arizona, stopped in Palm Desert, California to see Jody once more. And when he stopped, he met Jody at a Starbucks. It was at that Starbucks that they had some more discussions, and that was when Travis gave Jody the Book of Mormon. Shortly after that visit at Starbucks, Travis sent missionaries, Mormon missionaries, to Jody's house in Palm Desert. And those missionaries came to visit her once a week, from the end of, to the end of September all the way through October. The missionaries would have sit-down talks with Jody, discuss the LDS Church, discuss the Book of Mormon, and all the good reasons why it was to join and convert. And so, in November of 2006, just two months after meeting Travis, Travis convinced Jody to convert to Mormonism. Now, not only was Travis portrayed as an important member of prepaid legal, but he was a very important member of the Mormon church as well. He was a temple member. And a temple member is, is not just a member of the church. A temple member is, um, is special. It's special because in order to become a temple member, one has to actually live what they consider a worthy life. And a worthy life is someone who has no alcohol, no tobacco, no tea, no coffee. And above all, that person has no sex 
without marriage of any kind. It was a prestigious honor to be a member of a temple member, and Travis was. He was someone to be admired to Jody. He was a good Mormon man that she had met. And in November, Travis baptized Jody into the Mormon church. Now Travis and Jody took many trips together during the time that they knew each other. They, um, well, Jody, Jody is a wonderful photographer, and so much of their trips are actually documented in, in photographs. And so um, they took a lot of trips together for church trips, in other words, going to visit, visit different Mormon churches, um, special places for the Mormon church, and then just trips together. Um, certainly, on the outside, looking in, it really appeared like they were involved in a very loving and healthy relationship. But nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, behind the smiles in these photographs, there was a whole nother reality for Jody. A reality that Travis created. Because in reality, Jody was Travis's dirty little secret. From the moment, despite projecting himself as a good and virginal Mormon man, someone who was a temple member, from the moment he met Jody, he was pushing and pushing her to have a sexual relationship with him. And it took just about a week, because the weekend that they met at Chris and Sky Hughes' house, he got what he wanted. As Travis would explain to Jody, oral sex really isn't as much of a sin for him as vaginal sex. And so he was able to convince her to give him oral sex. And later in their relationship, Travis would tell her that anal sex really isn't much of a sin compared to vaginal sex. And so he was able to persuade her to allow him to have anal sex with her. Being a temple member and an executive director of prepaid legal, outward appearances would be very important to Travis. And so while he continued this facade of being a good and virginal Mormon man, he was inwardly dealing with his own sexual issues. And in Jody, in Jody he found somebody who was easily manipulated and controlled. Someone who would provide him with that secretive sexual relationship that he needed. While on the outside, he can still pursue the appropriate Mormon woman. Jody wanted nothing but to please Travis. And in doing that, she, at some points during their relationship, he would tell her, you know, you really ought, maybe you ought to see somebody else, date somebody else. But the moment that Jody would ever even text another man or talk to another man, Travis would instantly degrade her, yell at her, embarrass her, and humiliate her. And so Jody learned very quickly how to deal with Travis's temper. She learned how to deal with his temper by being humble, compliant, and agreeable. And that was one good way to help avoid his temper. Jody officially broke up with Travis in June of 2007. And this June of 2007 was, um, she broke up with him because she found out that despite having sex with Jody and saying things like he loved her, he was pursuing other women. And so because of that, Jody broke up with him. But Travis didn't want to break up. Travis begged her for forgiveness. And even though they were considered officially broken up, they never stopped seeing each other. They never stopped talking with each other, or emailing, or texting. Now at the time that they broke up, Jody was living in Big Sur, California, and Travis was living in Mesa, Arizona. In July of 2007, Travis sent Jody a poem. A poem that basically apologized for his behavior, and asked her to be with him. 
Later in July of 2007, Jody actually flew out to see Travis in Mesa and spent the weekend with him. That weekend sealed the deal because Travis showered her with attention, was nothing but sweet and kind. And so shortly after that, Jody moved from Big Sur, California to Mesa, Arizona. She moved in with a girlfriend of hers she knew from the Mormon church. Now despite the attention that Travis paid to Jody um, in private, he treated her far differently in the public eye. You'll hear how Travis degraded Jody um, to his friends. You'll hear that he often referred to her as a stalker or claimed that she was crazy. But, and if she did anything, um, like speak with another man or text another man, he would further degrade her by calling her names, names like slut and whore. He would text her these things and email her these things. The more that Travis distanced himself from Jody to his friends, the easier it was for him to keep control of her and to keep for his own sexual needs. Now, one of the witnesses that you'll hear from is named Alice LaViolette. Miss LaViolette is, a, is an expert in dealing with domestic violence. She has uh, decades, decades of experience with domestic violence counseling. And in fact, she started, I think, in 1978, counseling um, battered women in shelters. But today, her specialty is treating people for um, domestic violence. She treats the victims of domestic violence, but she also treats the abusers in domestic violence. Ms. LaViolette will explain to you how domestic violence relationships um, are created. She will explain to you that they are not created overnight. And she'll also talk to you about how in domestic violence, when we refer to domestic violence, we're not always talking about physical violence. In fact, a lot of times domestic violence comes from control through verbal abuse. She'll talk to you about the difficulty with domestic violence and how a lot of times domestic violence goes unreported and unprosecuted. She'll talk to you about the reasons for that because a lot of domestic violence victims are ashamed of what happens to them. Domestic violence victims sometimes fear that their abuser is going to get even more violent if they actually report it. And sometimes domestic violence victims believe and hope that the abuser will change like he promises he's going to. Most importantly, Ms. LaViolette will talk to you about why domestic violence victims have don't have the same ability that everybody else does to make that decision to leave. Because if somebody is abusing you, get up and leave. Ms. LaViolette will explain to you that it is not an easy decision to make for somebody who has been abused because there's a lot of psychological components that go into that decision. Now the best evidence of Travis's manipulation of Jody is his insistence to others that Jody stopped him. His insistence to others that Jody wouldn't leave him alone. But yet it was always at his demand and his beckoning that Jody spend time with him. In fact, at one point during their relationship, Travis even had a t-shirt made. A t-shirt made proclaiming his ownership of Jody. Now, I know that in some circles, and certainly in some relationships, maybe that would be considered cute or funny. But if you understand the inner workings of the relationship between Travis and Jody, that t-shirt is a perfect example of how Tro Travis treated Jody. Oftentimes, even, well, in April of 2008, um, Jody had had enough because Jody found out that once again, Travis was pursuing other women. Even though he was having her in his bed, Travis was still pursuing other women, and in April 2008, Jody had enough. 
She moved from Mesa, Arizona back to California, to Wairika, which is where her grandparents live. Even though she moved, Travis didn't let her go. He continued emailing, texting, and calling. He guilted her about leaving him. And the thing is, with the type of relationship that they were in, the minute that Travis was nice to Jody and caring about to Jody, she fell right back into that relationship with him. And so even though she left and moved states, they still continued to talk and email and text. In fact, even though they didn't see each other from April of 2008 until June of 2008, Travis was still able to use Jody for his own sexual desires through the phone and phone sex. You'll actually hear a recorded phone call, recorded call between Travis and Jody that's very explicit. And this phone call is made just a couple of weeks before Travis dies. It's clear in this phone call that the both of them are talking about how they're going to marry, find somebody, and marry someone else. Jody very clearly knows that Travis is not going to marry her, and she's not going to marry Travis. And they discuss it. Travis talks about how they're going to, he's going to Cancun with somebody else. Jody knew that. And she expresses absolutely no dismay about it whatsoever. And this is just weeks before he dies. Most importantly, most importantly, um, when you hear this call, it's, it's crucial to understand the difference. The difference between the type of person that Travis portrayed himself to be versus the things that he said on this recorded call. Because while he was supposed to be this virginal Mormon man who didn't want to have any type of relationship with Jody and she just wouldn't leave him alone, in this phone call he talks about his fantasies. His fantasies with Jody of tying her to a tree and putting it, forgive me, in her ass all the way. That's Travis. And then, when Jody pretends to climax during this phone call, Travis tells her that she sounds like a 12-year-old girl who was having an orgasm for the first time. And then he tells her, it's so hot. These comments are not comments of a man who is being relentlessly stalked and who does not want to have any contact with Jody. These are comments of a man who has a real problem with the comparison to the person he portrays himself to be and who he's supposed to be versus the person, his own private reality, and the person who he really was. So, what would have forced Jody? It was Travis's continual abuse. And on June 4th of 2008, it had reached a point of no return. And sadly, Travis left Jody no other option but to defend herself. On that horrible day, Jody believed that Travis was going to kill her. He threatened to kill her, and given her experience with him, she had no reason to not believe him. Travis knew that Jody was planning a trip to Utah because they had talked about it. He knew that she was going to stop along the way and see different friends of hers. He kept asking her to come and see him. And at the last minute, Jody decided that she would veer off and take a trip, short trip to Mesa to come and see Travis at his beckoning. And so she gets to Mesa early in the morning, around 4 or so in the morning. Um, Travis is in his den. He, which is downstairs, he's on the computer when she gets there. And we know this because there's a forensic examination done of his computer. So we know he was on the computer at 4 in the morning. 
Travis wanted to have sex, but Jody was said she was too tired. And so the two went upstairs and they went to sleep. They slept until about one in the afternoon. And when they got up at one in the afternoon, they began to engage in sexual activity. Um, Travis always had wanted to tie Jody up. And he had done it before. He had tied her up with rope before. But the rope he had used really hurt her. And so this time he was prepared. He had rope that was soft. The kind of rope that um, you know, people use for uh, decorating, the, to hold curtains back. So it's like a softer rope. He had that kind of rope. And he was ready. And so Travis tied Jody up, tied her to the bed with this rope. He used a knife to cut the rope when it was at the appropriate length. They engaged in sexual activity. And then part of what they were doing that afternoon, too, was that he wanted to take pictures of Jody. He had gotten a new camera just a month or so before, and he wanted to use it to take pictures of Jody. Now, um, the kind of pictures that Travis wants to take of Jody are the kind that would make most people cringe with embarrassment. And we show you these photos not for any type of shock value, but you're going to see them in trial. Because this is, these are the photos that Travis took of Jody, very up close. Travis also liked to see Jody in pigtails. And so she put her hair in pigtails for him. These photos were taken in the afternoon. Later that afternoon, Travis and Jody were downstairs, and they were back in his den. They were pouring through pictures of all of their trips together, all the different pictures that they had. And um, there was a problem, because Travis couldn't pull up pictures on his computer. And he was having a problem getting to see these pictures. Well, we know that there was a virus on Travis's computer. And we know that because of the forensic examination that was done. And so, when he tried to pull up these pictures, it wasn't working right. Well, Travis's temper flared, and he took the CD, and he threw it up against the wall in the den. Jody went immediately into protective mode. Protective mode means that she's trying to calm him down, trying to do something to avoid his temper, telling him that, it's OK, I'll fix it. Don't worry about it. And as she was telling him, she knew that the one thing that calms his temper the quickest is sex. So as she's telling him, it's OK, I'll fix it, don't worry, Travis grabbed her and spun her around. Afraid that he was going to hurt her, Jody was actually relieved, when all he did was bend her over the desk, pull her arm up behind her back, pull her pants down, and have quick and rough vaginal sex with her, ejaculating all over her back. When Travis was finished, Jody was allowed to get up and go to the restroom across the hallway from the den. She washed herself off. And then the two went upstairs to the bedroom, back up to get her stuff. But Travis, his temper had now subsided. And he was now back into the sweet talking mode. And he was sweet talking her to stay for a little bit longer. Because he had, um, in preparation for his Cancun trip that he was going to be leaving on shortly, he had been working out. And he had been dieting. And so he really wanted to have pictures taken of him, tasteful pictures, to show his progress on what he's done with his dieting and working out. And he wanted Jody, the photographer, to take those pictures of him. And so uh, she did. They went upstairs, and he went into the shower. Um, and Jody began snapping pictures of him, tasteful pictures, waist up pictures for Travis. She was snapping picture after picture after picture. And you can see that this one was taken at, these pictures are ultimately found and time stamped. So you'll see that this picture was taken at 529 in the afternoon and 20 seconds. The next picture is the last picture of Travis taken in the shower. And you can see that in this picture, he's, you can't tell so much if he's sitting or standing, but you can see that his shoulders are out. And in the next picture, you can see that his shoulders are out sitting on his knee. 
there's a difference of a little over a minute between the two pictures. This was the last picture of Travis taken in the shower during their photo session. Because the next picture is taken when Jody accidentally drops Travis's camera. You can see that it's not an intentional picture because one, it's blurry, but two, it's of the ceiling facing up. Jody accidentally drops Travis's camera. And as that camera was falling, that was enough for Travis because he lunged at Jody in anger, knocking her to the ground in the bathroom where there was a struggle. Jody's life was in danger. In just under a minute from this, in just a minute from this picture, we go to the next picture, where it's Travis's body. He's clearly injured already. In a minute. Now that very brief moment of time, a minute, is not the result of premeditation. It is not the result of a planned out attack. Just an argument. The evidence will show that it is not the result. Objection, pardon. Council approach. It is just one minute, just one minute of time between the camera falling until you see the picture of Travis with blood. One minute. In that one minute, had Jody not been forced to defend herself, none of us would be here. In that one minute, had Jody not chosen to defend herself, she would not be here. Thank you.